Owen Wickens. Hey, Rob. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, uh, nice to be here. Nice yeah. to be in Oslo. Welcome to Norway. Uh, you had some flight troubles. Ah, uh, a few few flight troubles. Yeah, getting in. Uh, I got in late last night. We were supposed to be here on Monday, but the uh, UK air traffic yeah. control kind of shot me a little bit. But yeah. uh, not not literally, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but now, but now you're here. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, besides your name, who are you? Uh, so I'm Owen Wickens. I work in adversarial research in a company called Hidden Layer. We basically do um, uh, security for artificial intelligence and machine learning, and I suppose that's the large portion of my job, is uh, basically looking at ways of attacking machine learning models, but also looking at ways of defending against uh, attacks as well. Um, so quite an interesting place to be. Um, but more personally, I guess, I'm from uh, Cork in Ireland. I'm from a little coastal place. Well, actually very coastal. I'm from an island off the coast. Um, so every 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 time I go traveling, it's a new big bold part of the world yeah. uh, for me. So that's nice. Yeah. But, um, yeah. You play golf? No, okay. I can I can I can hit a golf ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't play golf. Yeah. Yeah. Don't play golf. I think we'd probably end up losing all the balls off the cliffs if yeah. we were trying. Well, if that's a definition, I don't think, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I don't play golf. Either. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> Yeah, I've been to Ireland with a bunch of uh, a bunch of friends. Beautiful cool. country to live in. Yeah, fantastic. Where awesome. did you go? Uh, I have no idea. We we had um, two hours from Dublin, and we took mm -hmm. a bus every single morning from two different places. So we've been all cool. over the place. Yeah, spent all my money there. So absolutely, that yeah. tends to happen. Yeah, but it's cheaper <laughs> to have you here than me to go there, I guess. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you're like a walking buzzword then, I guess. Um, yeah, I think uh, people are really interested in what we're, what we're up to. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was at a conference the other day. Cool. Uh, Sikirets Festival, Security Festival. Right. 1,300 people there. Um, and one of the popular presentations was called AI, or AIs, uh, you know, is it good or bad for us? Mm -hmm. is, it, is security and AI viable is what it was called. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, introduce the topic. Uh, you, you can use AI for offensive purposes, for defensive purposes. And like all of us have probably heard all these use cases and for whatnot. Sure. Nothing new. Um, but he, there was one part of his presentation, he didn't really go into it, but he said the cybersecurity of AI. Yeah. And I already knew I was having this podcast. That's just why I went to go see that one. Uh -huh, excellent. But um, I don't think that's something that's often overlooked. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think like we're we're very caught up right now with how we use AI and how we implement it in our products. And I suppose what about I guess it's about a year ago now, ChatGPT kind of came onto the scene. Vision model, or not vision, but generative Gen models yeah. like um, Dali and Midjourney came out and kind of made us all question what like really meant to be human and stuff, which was yeah. kind of mad. But that that brought with it obviously the hype cycle. But I think what it brought was an awareness that AI has been integrated into almost everything, right? Mm. Like one thing I say an awful lot is that it's been, uh, you know, it, it makes so many decisions for us in our daily life, right? If you apply for a loan, uh, when you set your alarm with your voice assistant, uh, if you're your healthcare provider, if you're getting scans, often go, things go through AI, uh, mm. AI models to classify and everything. Mm. And I mean, that, that, that list goes on and on and it's used in production lines and everything. And I think it basically turned everybody's head to say, well, we've incorporated this into every facet of our lives. But how are we protecting it, right? Mm. And and can it be attacked? And I think that answer has been definitively yes. Mm. And I think we found it's been way easier than we anticipated as well. Mm. Um, because yeah, I think uh, you know that whole thought of like a super superhuman AI, you know, the singularity and everything. That's what everybody thinks of with AI. But I think that um, I think we need to kind of worry about like us attacking that before it starts attacking us. If you get what I mean. Mm. So you're uh, the hidden layer guys and girls. Uh, yeah. Are they? Uh, are you pen testers? No, not quite. Um, we're, we're kind of a mixed bag. So in in our research team, we're actually from a reverse engineering and threat intelligence background. Mm. So I suppose that was the lens we kind of brought into it. Yeah. Especially looking at things like um, model file formats and stuff. But we can talk about that another time. Um, we. We do do red teaming and stuff now. I guess that's part of the job, right? Is you end up red teaming models and stuff like mm. that. So you're kind of like looking at ways of of exploiting um, a, a model or determining decision boundaries. So what will influence a model? I always use uh, the example of let's say like a mortgage loan approval model, where you know you have particular features like the name, address, age, uh, dependents, 
um, salary, credit mm. score, etc. Right. So these things are all features and that are used and ingested by the model. We can then look at that and say, right, if we start tweaking the number of dependents to 15 or something crazy, right? Mm. What's what's going to happen? But it doesn't even need to be out of bounds, right? We can just like start manipulating certain features and see, okay, well, this model is actually susceptible to you know always approving a loan if there's people over the age of 75 or mm. something. Now that is obviously not a, a a real scenario there because I think um, you know mortgages typically are are favoring younger people in those instances. But we have actually had like real real world engagements with companies, and you'd be you'd be actually surprised what would influence and, and bypass classifiers, I guess. Mm. Um, but uh, I, I like mortgage loan approval models. You'll hear me reference it all the time. Uh, it does it's, it does translate to something we're all kind of used to. It's a good example. Uh, the the guy um, he was like the digitalization minister in uh, in, in Greece. Mm-hmm. He he was the one that was holding that presentation. And he used the. Here's an example where you had a picture of a cat. He's yep. like, um, 89% sure this is a Siamese cat, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then it was the same exact cat. And then it was like 99.9% sure this is a guacamole. And he was like, this is, uh, you know, that was his illustration of showing sure. like how you can poison a model, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And what he said after that, it was very, I, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was complex. But uh, for sure. I guess we'll start there when like your ideal clients, the clients you're speaking to, um, mm-hmm. not nothing like sales strategy, but like I would assume that they're clients that have, uh, an AI model or models that are yeah. taking important, uh, you know, B two C type of companies that are For sure. Yeah, yeah. What are they asking you about? Like, um, I think it's really context dependent. I think people. People implement AI or AI or ML. I kind of use the the term interchangeable. I think we all do, yeah. um, but. Everybody implements it in their own different way, right? And and each different industry has their own kind of risk vectors or what have you with with where they've placed the model, right? So with something like a mortgage loan approval model, for instance, you know, it's it's very real financial risk. Yeah. When you're looking at something like a production line, for instance, it could be image recognition for looking for for defects or so mm. on. And um, so like those are two completely wildly different use cases, but each one has. Um, a different risk uh, or a different threat vector associated with it. So, mm. so when they when they when then they speak with us and when we speak with them, it's it's they're usually worried about a speci- about a specific use case or mm. about a specific scenario, and sometimes they might not even realize that something could happen to that specific model, right? And and I guess we're talking largely about like decision time or inference time when a model's been deployed and you're you're sending queries to it or whatever. Mm. But there's all also stuff that can take place before and after that in you know throughout the whole like ML operations life cycle. Mm. So I think um I think we try and look at um, a, a, a company's company's system or a company where, where they've placed their uh, ML model uh, like holistically. So we look at the entire system to see kind of from 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 top to tail uh, where they could be vulnerable, basically, and, yeah. and through what stages of that life cycle as yeah. well. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Let me go back a little bit. Um, yeah, an organized person uh, by nature, but uh, so when a company's going to make an AI model. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I used to work for IBM. They were all, they were trying to get clients to use Watson. I know Microsoft has their own models. AWS, I would assume, a lot mm-hmm. of these big uh, SAS, big companies. Um, so, is it all AI model? All those everything's in the cloud, right? Mm-hmm. There's nobody that has like their own AI model that's not in the cloud, I guess. Uh, no, they 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 definitely deploy them. Like I don't know what you call it on prem, but they definitely do deploy them themselves as well. Okay. But but yeah, I mean, I guess everything's kind of migrated to the cloud, really. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like, um, if you're if you're creating that model, mm. that is often done with like large compute clusters, and I think there's like not as many people who have access to that like vast amount of like computational power, right? Yeah. Because that training process takes so much power, so much like like figuratively, literally, like electricity, computational power. I mean, we're dealing with like really expensive graphics cards that are running nonstop for for forever. Mm. I think um, OpenAI. I don't quote me on this. <laughs> good thing though. you're not on a podcast. Good yeah. thing, I, yeah. Good thing I'm not on, on record here. Uh, um, but I, I, if, if I, if memory serves me right, it takes like a substantial number of months. I think under a year, but like a substantial number of months for them to actually train up uh, one model, right? Oh, like wow. one of their like GPT models. Now uh, that, that's just going off stuff I've read on Twitter. I'm obviously uh, not privy to uh, OpenAI internals or whatever. But uh, it kind of gives you an idea of the scale that's required. So the chances of them having their own server farms would probably not be huge. But yeah, but I mean, most of the time, you know, like ChatGPT, we can ask it whatever we want, right? But sure. I mean, most 
most companies, I would assume, they're not. They're they're using AI for a a use case or yeah. maybe ten or something like that. So most companies maybe don't have to use that long time. Or yeah, like I think um, like that's for massive, gigantic models with like hundreds of billions, if not a trillion parameters, and yeah. and that stuff is really only done by like the big dogs. The you big could dogs. Say. Yeah. Like I can train up a model to do a classification task on my laptop in like you know a couple hours. It depends. Oh, really? Yeah. Or a couple of minutes. It yeah. really depends on like your num the amount of like training data you have yeah. as well as like again I suppose the computational power but like small use cases uh, and I guess when we're talking about models that aren't like 500 billion parameters mm. that kind of thing can be done very simply but it, it's purely context dependent ultimately yeah. you know um, but I guess it's 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 kind of cool to look at the scale right of the difference between you know like a, a model that I I can basically create on my laptop versus one of these like absolute behemoths that become a foundational model or what have you like um, like we we talk about like GPT uh, the the GPT models there and stuff but like even the the image classification models like AlexNet and stuff these are they're, they're trained on this data set called ImageNet and ImageNet is a collection of 150 gigabytes of images so you can imagine trying to fit that into you know, RAM or whatever, or mm. the VRAM, and then crunch that. It takes a lot, mm. um, but yeah, it's just it's just kind of interesting to think of the scale. At least yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. right. So yeah. I mean, uh, I'm very jealous actually of your company because you get to speak to business people. You're you're the, like one of the only security companies you know that actually gets to speak to like business people. And they want to speak with you, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, is it like that? Like when you go yeah. to meetings, you're you're meeting like in a, some sort of owner of a product of, of a company, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for sure, it's yeah. very. We're in, we're in a privileged position, I think, in in terms of AI, that people are actively looking for a solution to this, as yeah. well as like I think you know traditional security. It's you know there's a a, a a hundred vendors, and they're all kind of looking to to begging to talk to that person. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess there's it, it's. It's a kind of not a proven proven game, but I mean, antivirus has been around for what, like third, 20, 30 ah. years, and, and and so on. Do you know? But I guess with with this being a brand new technology, ah. I've. I think people are like unsure and uncertain, and I think especially when um, people are res much more responsible for cybersecurity risk, or, or are held much more responsible for for mm. cybersecurity risk. I think people people have like an active interest to make sure that they're not caught um, ultimately with their pants down, you know. Mm. Because uh, yeah, again, context dependent, but uh, you know the the ramifications can be quite serious yeah. depending on the the application. Yeah. Do they uh, going out of order again? I'm not sure what you studied, but if you uh, did, you study like some sort of like uh, machine learning stuff no, like that. No, no. no okay. um, so I did I did software development and networking. That was yeah. the course was originally called, but um, basically that was the gist of it. Uh, actually, with a focus on IoT devices. But then okay, I, yeah. I went and interned at a company called Silence. Ah, which Silence. Is, ah, Silence. Okay. Yeah. Now all of, uh, now I know why you're here again. Now, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. There we are. Yeah. So that's where I actually met um, the 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 founders and um, the research team now cool. um, and th there's quite a high proportion of us actually who have come from science because I suppose we had a, we had a good batch. Uh, security but, um, and AI, I'd say, so, yeah. Yeah, and I, look, I mean, I can tell you an interesting story about that. Um, back in 2019, uh, Silence, Silence's main uh, product was their AV engine, but it was uh, basically using AI to predict and uh, um, malware or to classify malware, basically, that it had never seen before. Mm. Right. So it was kind of one of the first applications of using AI within the cybersecurity. Defensive uh, purpose. For yeah. de exactly, for defensive purpose. So. In about 2019, uh, there was an attack. It was called Skylight Cyber, um, and it was published. It was yeah, it was published by a company called Skylight Cyber. Sorry, where they actually, I think it was called Silence. I kill you, which is a, a very strong, oh, yeah. very strong All out right. the gate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically, what they were able to do is they were able to reverse engineer the uh, the model which was deployed to the endpoint, and they were able to basically figure out what would sway or influence the machine learning model on the the. Uh, on the device, and then they found a subset of strings which they could append to any file to make it a successful bypass. And when I guess like there was a ton of us involved in the remediation effort for that, and we saw like, geez, this is this is not the most ideal of scenarios. Uh, but I think we also realized uh, that this was going to be a problem that was going to be generalized. I think we were seeing it kind of early, but it was going to be a problem that was going to you know, basically affect everybody, affect yeah. everybody mm -hmm. right? And especially with that adoption of AI over the the, the coming years. And mm -hmm. I mean, look where we are now, right? 
Um, so I guess we kind of had like first-hand experience of the real ramifications of a, a real-world attack, ultimately. And that was in 2019? That was in 2019. So that's when that's when the, the idea of Hidden Layer was born. For sure. Yeah, yes, that was absolutely. The, that was the moment. That was the moment, cool. yeah. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I can, see, I can imagine you guys sitting around that night having beer like them. That's uh, what I do about this, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, the, um, so they had, an attacker had obviously purposely d- did that and mm-hmm. called it Highlands, I kill you or something yeah, like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did you guys do about that? Ah, uh, well, that, I did mean, it lead to like a, I know you probably can't. I, I, yeah, I did, I'm probably but, limited on what I can say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess what I can say, like we we did have to remediate it. We had to come up with a solution to mm. to, to prevent that from happening. Um, I guess I probably shouldn't really. Okay, talk I'll ask about you this then. That specific example. Mm-hmm. What uh, what what is that a good example of attack wise? Like what what kind of attack was yeah. that? Okay, that yeah, I can answer that 100. Yeah. percent So what we 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 know that today to be an an, an inference attack. Yeah, um, so this is basically where you submit something to the model and then you read the output score, or like in this case, it's a, a classification. Yeah. Um, and what you're doing there is the, the is the model is inferring from the data a result. result so yeah. it's that, I, I guess that's my kind of butchered exa- yeah, explanation yeah. of of an inference attack. It works. Yeah. But then that that process of inference um, basically underpins. A kind of like a, a a category of attacks we call inference attacks. So like model bypass or model mm. evasion, which is kind of what that attack was really, where they're kind of bypassing or evading a classifier mm. for you know for illicit gain or what have you. And um, there's also other attacks that are kind of interesting that can be done simply by querying the model. And um, one of them is stealing the model entirely. So mm. if I submit <laughs> enough. Uh, images, or let's say I use images as an example. Mm. Uh, for let's say we have an image classification model, and I submit enough images, and I get back the uh, the predicted score, uh, predicted class. So mm. yes, we're predicting this cat as a cat. We're predicting this dog as a dog, uh, and so on. Right? If I feed it enough, I can actually train my own model based off the inputs and outputs that I've observed, mm. and that model can have a really high degree of accuracy. Can take a, f- a fraction of the compute power that the initial model took to compute and it can cost as of one paper said about thirty dollars right so you take this massive process that can really run up into a ton of money and it can be boiled down essentially or distilled and this is what it's actually called is model distillation or there's also other terms mm. like proxy modeling and surrogate modeling but you can steal a model just by doing that for very yeah. cheap which wow. i think is fascinating yeah um it's yeah. fascinating yeah, 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 and then when you think that, like, you know, models are people's intellectual property; it's their business advantage and everything. Like, and typically, you these models are exposed through the front door, if, if that makes sense. Like, they they are making decisions based on real world data, mm. and when you have a real world input being fed to that model, you can manipulate those factors to mm. to to get the model to 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 do something. And uh, so just by querying a model in typical fashion, you can end up performing these sort of attacks. And uh, you, you, it's so I guess part of it is, uh, you know, people figuring out where they're vulnerable, where they're exposed, how exposed their models are to mm. public influence, or not public influence, but to, to, to manipulation mm. outside of like internal processes and stuff. Wow. Um, but yeah. Really cool. So, the, yeah. so if I... Uh... I'm going to struggle with this thing. There's so many cool things I'm hearing. Uh, but there's inference attacks, and basically you just you, uh, you change the way it's being looked at, and you change the answer that it should have been. And then there's another one where you kind of steal the model. Uh, yeah, so, so inference attacks inference underpin attack. the two, uh, and, and they underpin model evasion or bypass. Um, uh, so inference is just the process of like, put something in, see what you get out. Yeah. Put some, you know, and yeah. that's that kind of thing. That's like the mechanism or whatever. And then the evasion is the... Um, like where you bypass the classifier by figuring out what that one thing is that'll change it, yeah. if, you, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, and then yeah. stealing the model entirely is just yeah. tons of inference queries stacked up and then another model trained over that, over that like input output pairs yeah. and then you get your 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 stolen model i guess it depends what your ai is doing for you but um yeah. all three of those could be like the end of your uh the business or whatever i guess yeah. or depending on cuz i guess these ai models they they replace the former way that, that company did that business process mm-hmm. or, right once you make an ai model that's all that's all your eggs are in that basket you don't they don't have like a plan b i guess like I, I i've been asked this question before like do you see like ai replacing uh, it was, it's more replacing jobs within like a, a sock, right? Yeah. Um, 
And I said, I don't think so. I think I think it's actually going to augment the sock because I, I back in back in the silence days now, for mm. instance, where we were re, were like you know we have our AI model, a large portion of like training that model and training like I suppose any model this is general a general thing is having labeled data that's like up to date right yeah. and and you with keeping up with the latest threats you want to make sure that that's labeled and fed mm. back into the system, and I can see the same thing happening for for other. Things I think the SOC is a nice example because you know we, we we think of like these new LLM security models that are coming out like SecPAM and I think CrowdStrike has one as well to to automatically hunt and detect things. Mm. I can see like the 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 SOC beginning to transition into a um, like data curation thing for for novel mm. threats. So allowing the SOC analyst to focus more on the cool stuff rather than explicitly having to you know triage every single event all the time, mm. but then they label that that gets fed back into the AI. So I think AI can really augment our workflows. I don't think it's quite there at replacing, but again, I guess I guess these it's really context dependent on the yeah. role, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's 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 interesting times because I don't think any of us really know where we're standing or if the ground underneath us is solid. Mm. But I guess that's the the cool thing about being in something that's kind of cutting edge right now. Yeah. So um, those attacks that you mentioned so far are those pretty much the what you use the majority of your time talking to clients about? Um, yeah, partially. Uh, partially. Um, I I I feel like I've left one out as well. The really important with in terms of like inference or decision time stuff. But um, oh yeah, what we can also do with with inference is you can actually pull like pull training data out of the model or understand if a model was trained on particular data. Mm. And what that allows us to do, let's say, within pulling uh, a model, uh, pulling information out of the model, if there's like personally identifiable information in the model, like mm. let's say, for instance, hypothetically, you query your large language model asking for, you know, give me example bank account details or example an example address or whatever. Actually, I've got a real world example of this. Um, somebody asked ChatGPT for um, a phone number or a, some, a contact number for it, and it gave out this uh, this dude on Twitter's uh, signal, uh, uh, like signal phone number. I guess that's his actual phone number. Mm. So he was just getting hit up saying, like, ChatGPT gave me your number and stuff, right? So you have this, like, the models learn this data because I guess it kind of overfits or whatever. So it retains that information mm. and then it can, you can also retrieve it out of it. So that's a whole other kind of branch of what you can do with inference. But outside of that, then um, we look a lot at like model serialization attacks. And, and that's basically you have your machine learning model. Like you know, the the you you've done the training. It's been computed down into the mathematical model. Then you save it to disk, right? So that's mm. the the serialization process, right? That is stored in one of like I don't know, is it like twenty different model formats? And they're largely bespoke to machine learning, but can like come in like traditional things that we're kind of used to dealing with. But a lot of these model formats are like really insecure. So there's, there's this one library mm. called Pickle, for instance. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's it's it. I I, I didn't, didn't really know about it until I kind of started looking into machine learning. And once I started looking, I realized, geez, this is everywhere. And it's well documented. It's been talked about an awful lot. But the Pickle file format underpins the PyTorch uh, library as its main model serialization format. PyTorch today is makes up 86% of all models used in one of like the most popular uh, uh, model repositories, Hugging Face. Mm. But what we can do with pickles is pretty much anything. We can inject arbitrary code in there, execute anything we want. We've done we've done demonstration attacks where we actually embed ransomware into the model itself, then pull it out, inject it back into its own process, and do all sorts of mad stuff. Purely based on, well, not purely based. I, there's some cool steganography stuff which I'll, I, I won't dive into right now, but uh, we, we can use, we can abuse these serializ or deserialization exploits to create, you know, malware like this, right? Mm. And uh, that's really scary because it's so ubiquitous. Like these, these, like um, these file formats that can be abused are so ubiquitously used throughout the industry. Yeah. Um, like they become like the main, it's like the main thing that people use, right? Mm. So you're kind of introducing this like really susceptible and really vulnerable attack vector into your data science pipelines. And mm. then like, you know, the 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 galaxy brain thinking that I'd be doing some evenings, like when I'm trying to <laughs> when I'm trying to get to sleep goes, oh my God, the models are like exposed to all the training data. And the training data could be like 
oh my God, it could be all the PII. And, you know, and yeah. then you start thinking about, again, the system holistically, and you think about like you know, the data that these models are exposed to. And I guess like, you know, what we've done some stuff to really highlight worst case scenarios. But if you have, if you have a backdoor in a model, for instance, and you can start siphoning out the queries anytime a model's queried, or if you mm. can run a command and control server through a model, through normal inference, which is actually some something that uh, uh, Tom, he's the vice president of research in the company, demonstrated at FCON this year. Um, like, if you can do that, like uh, in a, in an environment which is, let's say, ripe for the picking, like that's that's pretty scary. So that's a whole like other subset of things that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, but it's been uh, it's been really fun. This is really cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. No, glad you think so. I love mnemonic, but uh, you know, if I get if they fire me, I'm gonna call you <laughs> immediately. Um, so you you were talking about the um, like the libraries they're using. For sure. It kind of started made me think about like open source, right? Yeah. Um, and I guess these AI models, obviously, I'm uh, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but so they kind of follow like the rest of the software development world. Like you know, there's libraries that are for free out there, and people just pick and choose what makes yeah. makes sense for them, and it's all in yeah these libraries. And for but sure. that's also very vulnerable, just like open source can be, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, like the. The, I suppose one of the really amazing things that I also love about working in, in I suppose, machine learning and everything these days is the amount of community contribution and mm. the amount of uh, community support. Like the, all the most, well, all of the, I, I would, yeah, I would nearly say like 99% of machine learning libraries are open source and freely available for people to use, mm. you know, and that's coming from like major companies like, you know, Meta's developing PyTorch, Google's developed TensorFlow. Um, the, the, these companies are actually releasing these models as well. So not just the libraries, which like support the development, which is like a great thing for, for, for people like uh, you or I to, de- to be able to develop these systems mm. and, and build on abstraction layers that they've implemented. But like they're also giving away the uh, results of like this massive computation over massive amounts of training data to mm. make to basically provide everybody with foundation models. Yeah. And um, let's say you want to train a, a model for your specific use case, right? And you want it to have like really good like um, natural language programming skills, so it can really understand what you're saying. But I want it to do this specific task, like it be a support agent or mm. communicate in the, you know, vo- with the vocabulary of like a, say, a, a pirate in the 1600s okay, yeah. or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you can take one of these foundation models that like Google or Meta have released and everything, and then you can fine tune it, right? Mm. And this process of fine tuning, I think we can also refer to it as like transfer learning, is where you like take that result of, of all that computation, fine tune it for like like wait, like I mean, a f- an infinitesimally, fra- infinitesimally small fraction mm. of that cost, and then train it to suit your bespoke use case, right? Mm. So it's effectively given, like all of these open source developers, and given like companies a way into um, using leveraging, mm. yeah, it, using that and for leveraging, lowering for, the barrier of entry, basically. It, exactly, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should have said that. That's, uh, that's yeah. I'm that's, a sales guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the future, what do you think you're going to be using your time, more of your time on? Like, what are the problems that we're going to be starting to hmm. encounter? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. This is my crystal ball question. That a crystal ball question. Crystal ball question. Yes. Hmm. I think that the attacks are probably going to be a bit more commonplace going forward. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of... Because they're using their time on this now, right? The, the adversaries are... Yeah, for sure. And I think there's been like a, a lot of contributions within the open source community for developing attack tools. Uh, well, model of ev- like model evaluation tools as well really? as like attack tools to, yeah. to red team your own models and stuff. Like yeah. there, you've got like IBM's adversarial buses toolbox. Okay, cool. You've got a counterfeit, which was developed by Microsoft, which uses... Adversarial bosses toolbox and queued out as text attack under the hood to attack models. And like, you know, that one, for instance, is like an abstraction layer, like ease of use abstraction layer. And it's very metasploity in a way, right? And mm. I guess it was built with that in mind. So like the, uh, um, that's not naming like another like 20 or yeah. 20 plus tools that can do these things. But I, I think that once the, the tooling starts getting there, like we kind of saw like a sea change moment back when like Metasploit came out and everything and then Cobalt Strike and everything. And like we, we've seen what's happened as a result of that. Mm. Leaked copies getting into the hands of people. I think once the, the, once the tooling catches up to make these attacks even easier, mm. uh, I can see that the rate of attacks, especially like inference, will become more of an issue. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And we see that today with Cobalt Strike and Brute Rattel or whatever, right? For like sure. The, the, the advertisers using the same thing that Pentesters was meant to be made for Pentester, I guess. But for then, sure. Um, and then once that gets commoditized, then does this, does the sock, I guess the, the sock will never be looking at this sort of stuff, I guess. Well, or who we, looks at it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a really good question because I think <laughs> we've kind of been angling to kind of get the data science and sock teams to be kind of communicating in a similar manner that, I guess this is maybe a crystal ball prediction, but in a similar manner to the way your um, incident response handles things as an escalation point for your SOC, right? So with the SOC, they can triage a particular um, a, a event or whatever in the dashboard. And then if they, they look at it and they go, right, this is of particular significance here. Uh, this aligns with uh, like the MITER ATLAS framework. Mm. Uh, that's something I, I'll come back to in a second. They can then escalate that up to their data science teams who can understand okay. it with the, with the accurate context. Because cool. I think ultimately we believe that, um, you know, security should be a security problem. Mm. And data science, data scientists should be allowed to do data science. Data yeah. science. And I think um, obviously there's room for, for both. In, in each thing, but mm. starting to bring these these uh, fields kind of closer together is like really important. In the same way that we kind of saw that with like software engineering and and uh, and and so on. You know, we've got vulnerability assessment tools and everything, and mm. we've got our software engineers. And I suppose you know, uh, with long gone are the days of the buffer overflow. Or I mean, yeah. maybe I'll eat my words, but you know what I mean. Like that that had to converge, and um, so I can definitely see the same thing happening here. Um, uh, an interesting, mm. an interesting thing um, that I suppose we work towards that's been really um, helpful. I think for helping people understand the 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 problem space that is adversarial machine learning mm. is the MITRE ATLAS framework. So you're probably familiar with MITRE ATT&CK. MITRE ATT&CK, I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like that's for like you know mapping out uh, attacks on endpoints, basically in in the like a dyna dynamic behaviors yeah. kill chain. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, well, MITRE ATLAS is essentially the equivalent of that for mapping out the adversarial machine learning space. Cool. Um, which is which is fantastic because we can like point to that and be like, this is the attack that you're facing, and this is you know this is some, these are case studies around that, and here's additional context, right? Mm. So so working with MITRE to 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 well, well using using the MITRE ATLAS framework to define that standard has been like really really important, and I mm. think that's um, I I can see MITRE ATLAS going the way of MITRE attack yeah. uh, in terms of popularity and in terms of and, and just basically as the AI industry matures and we start to see this really kind of come to the forefront. Yeah, well, that's cool. I bet you use that all the time just for to sure. cut, use, uh, yeah, awesome. Well, um, I'm looking for, I mean, I'm just, one last thing, like I'm thinking of, you know, in Mnemonic, we sell sock services, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we always tell clients like, yeah, we shelfware, you know, Whatever, as long as we've seen it before, I mean, it's in our form map, blah, blah, blah. But if as soon as we're ma monitoring a custom application, we have to understand the application. We have to mm -hmm. do, you know, what what's the worst thing that can happen. But that's kind of where we are now with these attacks too, I guess. That's why SOC's not involved. I'm um, not even sure what the hell like, kind of question that was. I'm just, yeah, no worries. No, uh, like I, I get what you're saying though. Like how can how can the SOC triage something they don't understand is what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess there's definitely like a learning element to it yeah. in terms of like understanding the context behind the attack. Like our like without doing a product hawk, mm. our one our main flagship product is called MLDR, right? Which is machine learning detection response. Awesome. So what we try to do with that, and the reason I'm explaining this without trying to go too deep into the product yeah. hawk uh, rabbit You're hole. You're totally allowed to do that right now. Uh, uh, am I allowed to do uh, that? Okay, cool, cool. Well, we wanted to analogize it with something, a concept that people were familiar with, which detection is... Detection response, yeah, yeah. Endpoint detection response, yeah. you know, MITRE attack, MITRE ATLAS, right? Yeah. And I think sometimes people think that, you know, we're doing like machine learning over endpoint telemetry, which is not the case, but like this, it's monitoring the inputs and outputs of machine learning models. Mm. Um, but through that, we're basically able to kind of uh, provide a, a, an analogous solution that people can understand and they okay. can use MITRE ATLAS to reference like the specific detection that's popping up in their dashboard and so on. And I think that's been like really important um, like in, you know, endpoint protection or sorry, EDR, yeah. like, because like 
I mean, I worked in I worked in EDR for for I think about a year, like creating rules and everything. I can tell you a few of the rule tech, a few of the techniques, and you know what they what like like the actual technique mapping and everything. But like to have an like eidetic knowledge of of every single one of those is is very difficult, right? So yeah. as long as you have a third party resource where you can actually fully understand, or where you can understand and gain more context. I think um, I think like that same kind of principle will hold true once people just kind of get a bit more comfortable and familiar yeah. with with the yeah, your products will shine a light. This is over here. You need to look instead of you having to figure out all. This. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. Yeah, cool. leave us do the hard work, and then you can triage and awesome. and and kind of dive deeper into yeah. it. Then if you deem it. Reason. Oh, I'd buy it. What else do you have under are. the hood, actually? What, what, uh, one say, what do I have uh, in here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your flagship. Is there anything else? Like, uh, yeah. Is there anything else that uh, I don't even go through all of them? Any other cool. very yeah, cool yeah. ones that for I, sure. I so, think it's cool? So yeah. we, we have a model scanning solution as well. So like one of the things, and we, we actually developed this out of like a need for ourselves. Is this like vulnerability scanning? It kind of sounds like uh, it. Yeah, yeah, similar, similar. Yeah. Um, so again, like, yeah, it's another analogy, right? Yeah. It's like, Keep them coming. We wanted to basically scan our machine learning models because ah. we, we were downloading ML models all the time, and uh, you know we like the more we kind of realized, the more we were there going like, oh, this this model format is vulnerable. This format's vulnerable. This can inject. This can have code injected in it. We can abuse the actual instructions in this format to wipe the system and stuff. You know. And when because we're downloading them from like you know uh, open source repositories, we were just like really worried then that like what if we download something that has a backdoor in it? Like how can we tell? So we developed model scan to basically protect against um, to protect ourselves against that, and then realized that again this is something that people are going to need, yeah. right? So. Um, we basically can do integrity verification. We can check for malicious code within the models. Um, people ask me, you know, like, cool. oh, why, why is this? Why is like, you know, endpoint protection not doing? Why is antivirus not doing this? Even I've been hmm. in cybersecurity for too long, it seems. Um, <laughs> uh, why is antivirus not doing this? And like, ultimately, it's because these are like all different file formats. They mm -hmm. all have their own specific requirements, and often they require a bit of a, you know, a bit of experience with that. You know the how it's used within the data science context to fully grasp and understand, um, you know what's going on in there, and like you can start messing with models in other ways too, like messing with the the neurons in a neural network, mm. and then affecting the output classification. We can do all sorts of weird and wacky and wonderful stuff. Mm. Well, I guess maybe not wonderful, but I you know mm. from from a, from a researcher perspective, it's kind of cool. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that we can attest to the integrity of these of these files and make sure that we're not going to end up compromising ourselves and that other people yeah, right. aren't going to compromise themselves either. And one last thing on that point is like uh, I, I, I've said this a few times now, but like the the worst thing, like you know, we wanted people to give we wanted to give people a way to scan their models when they're downloading them, mm. but also if they're sending those models out or if they're deploying them with their products, right? Because like, what's the worst? Like, what could be worse than being involved in a supply chain attack? Being the supplier of the supply yeah. chain attack, right? right? So like, when models huh. are going out the door, mm. that's also like extremely important. That you know you can assure that there's a certain level of 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 protection, of, of protection yeah. integrity, and that it's that it's safe. <sighs> so yeah, that's. Those are our main products at the minute. We've, uh, we've got some other cool stuff in the works. I have but. no idea what I'm going to call this episode, but if I could, it'd be called... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm glad you've enjoyed it. I, I cheers for really listening to me it. rattle on about it. Oh, but, it's uh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess my um, my closing words of thoughts, you know, you have like, you had ransomware, that was mm -hmm. like the big thing, and then now it's, I don't know if it's, uh, what do they call it? Were they just encrypted, they don't do ransom anymore. Oh, double extortion. Uh, double extortion sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, just the extortion part, I guess, is what's, what's yeah, hot now, yeah. or whatever. This is going to be one of those. This will be one of those big. Uh, or don't you think? Will this be I one think, of those I think really big I think problems it's going to be big. for? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be big, and I just I don't think we're fully understanding the exact ramifications right now of where the uh, of of how these attacks can affect us and where mm. they're happening. Right. Mm. Because ultimately, if you're not monitoring for these attacks, like how can you tell if you're under attack? Right. It's kind of one of these like yeah, yeah. catch twenty two. Catch yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so I think once like I. We know it's happening. We've had out of stations. It's happening. We have people come to us and say, "Yeah, we 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 didn't know what to do about it, right?" Mm. And that is enough for me to to understand that uh, that this will be a problem for a long time. And I think it will become uh, its own major category of of attack. Absolutely, yeah. you know. I mean, this happened to you and in, in Silence in uh, 2019. Exactly. So they, there's a there's somebody out there that has four years of experience with this. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
probably taking a Lamborghini in some yeah. <laughs> uh, country that uh, doesn't like the West. Uh, but, uh, quite possibly. Yeah. Quite possibly. Mr. Wilkins, awesome. Thank you uh, very much. How old are you, by the way? 25. 25? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm jealous. You're going to be a very rich man. I don't know about uh, that. Well, you deserve it, at least. Thank you so much for your time, and best of luck to, uh, to you and, and to Hidden Layer. Fantastic. We'll be following you moving forward. Thanks a million, Robbie. Cheers Thank for you. having me on.